Let me get this up and going for those at home. All right, here we go. All right, the language of the Holy Spirit. All right, Brother Tommy, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 28. Romans chapter 8. Likewise, <clears throat> Likewise the Spirit also helpeth help, help our infirmities, but we know not what we should pray for. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh its intercession for us, and the groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that suffers searches the heart north of his mind. What is the man in the Spirit? Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them who love, that love God, to them who are called according to this purpose. Amen. Born of, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the first of the Yes, sir, that's, that's good. Brother Dwight, uh, Ephesians 6 18. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, be with your spirit. Amen. Okay. Ephesians 6.18. I think that was praying with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit. Uh, let me. I might have gave you the wrong verse. You see that in there, Ephesians? I probably gave you the wrong verse. Yeah, Ephesians 6.18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. I apologize for that. Brother Quest, Jude. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Brother, Brother Cook. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath, wrath and doubt. Amen. And in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, says this. It says, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I was preparing for... I really didn't know what to do for Sunday school. I had a lot of... Uh, things that I was thinking about, particularly in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. A lot of it I was leaning toward the, the leading of the Holy Spirit, but just the very fact that my wife is not very long from, from going into labor, it just, it just really provokes me more and more into prayer and say, Lord, would you please help my wife and, and what she's going to endure. I've seen her with the very first labor with, with Elijah, and that was very, very painful. And uh, in fact, sir, I'll tell you, I was in tears over that. Uh, when it came to Joey, it was much more calm, peaceful. She had everything under control mentally. Uh, she seemed to, to just be focused and ready to go for that labor. But when I think of twins, that's a whole different ball game, you know. And uh, so I spent a lot of time focusing on prayer, and particularly prayer in the Holy Spirit, as Brother Tommy had mentioned there in Romans chapter 8, praying with all prayer. Sometimes it's that groaning and that that, that, that laboring of the Holy Spirit that we need because many times, I don't know about you, but many times I don't know what to pray for as I ought, whether it's the peace of Jerusalem. And of course I know that I'm commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but how to pray many times. We, we, we lift it up and say, Lord, according to your will, but Lord, you've got to show me what that will is in order to help me to pray. Many uh, think back years and years ago, and it's going to be probably, be, maybe be, Savannah might have seen it, I'm not sure, but it might even be before your time, okay? In fact, I'm sure that it is, because when I was little, uh, the show's like the old Batman. You know, you have the new Batman, which is completely different, but I always like the old Batman, where you have Adam West, and you see the, the little displays of bam, pow, wow, wham, and, and just highlighting the whole screen in that 1955 Lincoln Futura, that, that Batmobile, as he's flying down the road, and we think to ourselves, wow, that was the coolest ever. Anybody else get that impression? Maybe it was just me as a little kid. I, I think to myself, Batman was the coolest. I know Superman, and there's a lot of that other stuff going on, but Batman was the coolest during that time. And, uh, but the plot line was always the same, wasn't it? You know, there's always trouble stirring in Gotham City. It's always, uh, whether it's the Riddler, whether it's Joker, whether it's Catwoman, and they're always stirring up some sort of trouble, right? And the commissioner, he's just always trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do? And trouble stirring here in Gotham City. we got to do something. I know what we'll do. We'll call Batman. 
And so what does he do? He goes over into his, his little office. And there in the office, there upon his desk, covered in this little glass dish, I mean, it looks like a little cake dish, the best I remember, and he pulls it off, and there's that cherry red phone, and what does he do? He picks it up, and he dials one button. I, I like that. It's sort of like speed dial that we have today. They, they were way advanced in the past, more than we give them credit for, right? Speed dial. Had, had Batman on speed dial, picked him up, and said, Batman, we need your help, right? Maybe... Uh, that's the best of my memory. That was way, way back I'm pulling from. And so he, he calls him up and he comes to the rescue, but he had a direct line of communication to get in touch with, with, with Batman. And it was Batman that ended up saving the day, and uh, it was always all inspiring as a kid. Now today, yeah, I, I tell you what, it's a different time, isn't it? Uh, it wasn't... I guess it was about 10 years ago when cell phones started to become popular. I used to see these kids. We'd drive by and see these kids on the buses and they pull out their cell phones and talking. I said, who would give a kid that young a cell phone? They would always give the excuse in case of emergency, but, but that, that's besides the point. But they, they, I guess what I'm getting around to is kids would always call up their mommy and daddy for help. You know, and many of you didn't have that advantage. Of course, they would come to your rescue when you needed them, when they'd say, son, do this or son, do that. But you didn't have uh, that kind of access that they, they had back in that time. Uh, sometimes people ask the bank to bail them out of trouble. That's never a good thing. Uh, sometimes it's Ed West and they call him up and say, hey, my power's out. Would you do something about it? This is broken, that's broken, and they always call you to come to the rescue. But we have one that's greater than that, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and, and the praying, praying specifically in the Holy Spirit. I'm thankful that He straightens out all my prayers. Language is an important thing for communication. Sometimes I think my prayers go up and uh, I, I get it all jumbled, right? Anybody else like that? You, you're praying and praying. You're like, Lord, I hope you're making sense out of this. <laughs> Uh, I had a friend when I was in the army. He was Vietnamese descent, and uh, he took me on occasion to some restaurants that he was very familiar with. Indonesians. Usually, we were there at the end of the day when everything was getting ready to shut down. To him and his Indonesian friends, he would speak to him in Vietnamese, and they're carrying on this long conversation. And I'm sitting there. I don't understand a word that they're saying. That drives me crazy. They're talking and, uh, I mean, they're just laughing and carrying on and part of me wonders, are you making a joke about me? <laughs> uh, he, a friend, you know, he wouldn't do that, but he, there's always that suspicion. I hate it when we're trying to get a hold of somebody important. Maybe it's the VA, maybe it's somebody else. Maybe it's a company that you're trying to get in touch with and you get some foreigner and they're talking to you. You're like, I don't understand what you're talking about. Can you just give me somebody who speaks English? Anybody else have that problem? And you're like, I, I need somebody who can understand what I'm going through and can help me. And I'm glad that the Holy Spirit can straighten those out. Talking to God doesn't have to be that way. It's an intimate language. It's a language between the Heavenly Father and His children. And we find in our text that many times prayer is connected with the Holy Spirit of God. And uh, that's His language. And uh, by the way, the other language of the Holy Spirit is the Word of God. So this morning, here's, here's what I want you to get. I want you to see the importance of prayer and its association with the Holy Ghost. We read where the disciples, I just finished here reading in Matthew chapter 26. Jesus is going out, He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's getting ready to face the cross. He brings a couple of his inner circle with him, Peter, James, and John, and he brings them along with him just a little bit closer so that they can watch and pray. This is what he tells them. He says, I want you to watch and I want you to pray. And he goes in a little, just in a little intimate place by himself and he's offering up strong prayers with crying and supplications which is beyond our imagination. And it's a very intense prayer. And I'm glad that God prays that way for us as well. But he tells them, he says, the disciples come up to the Lord, and he says, Lord, teach us, Lord, teach us to pray. 
And what I'm getting at is the disciples were well versed in the Judaism and they would often watch the Pharisees and how they would pray. It was always that vain repetition and always that long and lofty prayers and they would offer up so many prayers I don't even know if they were convinced that they were speaking to God. And they just pray all the time, making pretense, you know, devouring widows' houses and so forth. We read all that in Scripture. And you can imagine, you know, as everybody's looking up to the Pharisees, they're thinking to themselves, well, that's how I have to be. I have to be righteous. I've got to be great. I've got to be a, a wonderful prayer warrior, just like the Pharisees. In fact, Jesus tells us quite the opposite. He says, don't be like those guys. And then the disciples are watching Jesus pray. And they come to one conclusion. And they say, we don't know how to pray at all. Jesus doesn't pray like the Pharisees. They think to themselves, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, help us to pray. And the only way that we can pray in the Holy Spirit is if we're spiritual people ourselves, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. Saved by the grace of God. But here they, they wanted to pray just like Jesus had prayed. Pastor Norman Johnston was well known for his childlike faith. I'd often hear Dr. Alton Beale and Brother uh, Dr. Spencer and many of the others, and they would talk about him. And they said he just had such a way with prayer. It was just a childlike faith sort of prayer. <coughs> It wasn't just to impress anybody. It was just really simple. I mean, prayers like my son would pray or prayers like anybody else would pray. They say, well, Lord, you know, this is your child and, you know, she, she needs your help right now. And it was something like that along those lines. Very, very easy. But he wasn't there to impress anybody. He just knew that he was the, the Son of God and God would hear his prayers. And he was very convinced about that fact. And so when he would pray, it just often impressed people that way because he had such a childlike faith and trust in God. I mean, he, he just took it for granted that God would answer the prayer. You see what I mean? But that's the kind of prayer warrior that he was with complete dependence on the all-sufficient Savior. And uh, we have to learn to draw upon our relationship to Jesus when we pray. And that's the basis of all our prayer. The Bible says that God the Father already knows what we have need of before we ask him anything. Brother Tommy was mentioning that to me last week, I believe it was, or maybe the week before last, I can't remember. But he already knows what I have need of. Even before I lift up the first word. And sometimes we think to ourselves, why, why should I have to pray? He already knows what I need. Well... A sinner who's well aware of his desperate need of being in sin and his relationship with God being broken and everything else, he comes to the realization after hearing the gospel and he says, well, this is the Savior. This is what I need. I need to be saved by the grace of God. He's putting all the pictures together. What does he have to do? He still has to call upon the name of the Lord that he might be saved. However he's done, I mean, even if he, he can't speak sign language, whatever, he's, he's talking to his Heavenly Father. But he still has to call unto the Lord. That's the same with us. Even though he knows what we have need of. We're still calling upon Him to come to our rescue or whatever the case may be. But prayer is a communication of a great sense of our need. And we must realize that we're not built or designed for ourselves, but for a relationship with God. So relationship is the first thing that we learn about prayer. And the Holy Spirit does not lead except in the one He's right, rightly related to. The Holy Spirit cannot produce spiritual fruit except you be His. And the language of the Holy Spirit is the language of His of relationship. Just like uh, I mentioned in Romans chapter 8, when a child cries out, Abba, Father, the Holy Spirit helps do that. So we understand that uh, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name. What does He say? I'm in the midst of you. 
Where two or three are gathered together, it's, it's all about Jesus being in the midst of you. And uh, he says he'll be there. We're instructed to pray in the name of Jesus, John chapter 14, verse 13. And whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. By the blood of Jesus, who is set on the cross of Calvary for us, His resurrection from the dead were sanctified once for all. He says, For by one offering He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof... The Holy Ghost is also witness to us. Ephesians 2.13 But now in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Hebrews 10.19 Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Now this is what I want you to get, because prayer is only made possible, why? Because of what Jesus Christ has done in going to the cross for us. That's the only way that it's made possible. It's not, a lot of times we put so much dependence upon our flesh. And we say, if I just pray more strongly, if I pray in this way, and if I pray in that way, and we put so much emphasis upon the, the flesh. Well, Jesus Christ died for us. That's the whole, the whole point about prayer. When he, he, he agonized there in the Garden of Gethsemane, when He went to the cross, when He was dead, when He buried, when He was risen again from the dead on the third day, because of what He has done, makes it possible of everything that we do in prayer. Based upon the atonement, based upon being in His name, gathered together in His midst, where two or three are gathered, all of it is based upon what Christ has done. And the Holy Spirit always brings us straight back to Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I find that pretty exciting. Because it's everything that Christ has done. And the Bible tells us in... Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. says where Jesus, uh, uh, if I can remember how the verse goes, it says, He being tempted, He's able to secure them, or He's able to help or able to save those who are tempted. And I think back that there in the Garden of Gethsemane where He brings up those strong prayers, those cries, which He offered up to God and He was heard and that He feared. He's able to help me because of what He has endured. And that same groaning, those same cries, those same utterances, the same thing that we find in Romans chapter 8 where the Holy Spirit is also groaning with things, I mean, beyond my understanding, okay? But the Holy Spirit knows what the will of God is. In 1 John chapter 5, he tells us that we know that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us based upon our relationship, based upon being in the will of God. And of course, uh, you know, he brings out an example later on. He says there's people you ought to pray for and some not. Well, how am I to know what the will of God is? Romans chapter 8. Because you already mentioned it and you already said it. Romans chapter 8, I believe it's verse 27. After he tells us that the Holy Spirit prays with groanings and things which cannot be uttered, verse 27, And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. According to the will of God. When we pray in the Holy Ghost, we begin to have a more intimate understanding of God. And only when we realize the holiness and awareness of the abiding presence of God do we truly realize our great sense of need. I, I want to press on past this for just a moment. Paul prayed three times in Second. Timothy, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Three times he went to the Lord. Of course he wanted the thorn in the flesh to be removed. But he didn't know what the will of God was at that point in time. He just saw, well, I'll just keep crying out to him. Maybe like Elijah, he'll answer. If I just keep on praying. But three times and he gets the answer... What's the answer is God's will. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. That was God's will. That was the Holy Spirit praying, not Paul praying. 
There's a post on Facebook I want to read to you. Because sometimes we find ourselves in situations like Paul. And we pray and we say, Lord, what's your will? Would you please remove this flesh? Would you please take this away? Would you please do this? Would you please do that? We're trying to pray the best we can with our limited understanding as fallible human beings. But I found this uh, post on Facebook uh, posted by Kimberly Henderson. I don't know who she is, but it goes like this. It says, I would have pulled Joseph out, out of that pit, out of that prison, out of that pain. I would have cheated nations out of one God who would use him to deliver them from that famine. I would have pulled David out, out of harm's way, away from the spear-throwing presence of Saul, out of the caves in which he hid, out of the pain of rejection, and I would have cheated Israel out of a king made after God's own heart. I would have pulled Esther out, out of being snatched from her family, out of being placed in a position she'd never asked for, out of the path of vicious, power-hungry foe, and I would have cheated the people out of a woman God would have used to save their very lives. I would have pulled Jesus off the cross, off the road that led to suffering and pain. I would have pulled Him off the path that led Him to nakedness, beatings, nails, and thorns. And I would have cheated the entire world out of a Savior, out of salvation, out of an eternity filled with no more suffering and no more pain. And oh friend, I want to pull you out. I want to change your path and to stop your pain. But right now, I know I would be wrong. I would be out of the line. I, I would be cheating you out and cheating the world out of so much good because God knows what is best. He knows the good that, is, that this pain will produce. He knows the beauty of this hardship will grow. He is watching over you and keeping you even in the midst of this. He is promising you that you can trust Him even when it feels like it's more than you can bear. So instead of trying to pull you out, I'm lifting you up. I'm kneeling before the Father. I'm asking Him to give you strength and hope. I'm asking Him to help you stay prayerful and discerning. I'm asking Him how I can best love you and to be a help to you. And I'm believing He is going to use your life in a powerful and beautiful way. Ways that will leave your heart grateful, humbly thankful for this road that you're on. Many people don't pray that way, do they? Because we do find ourselves in situations like that and we say, Lord, would you please deliver? Lord, would you please stop this pain? Lord, would you please do this and do that? And I like how beautifully she shows us that some of the things God allows to bring something beautiful out of a hard situation. We don't know the will except for what the Holy Spirit reveals to us in His Word. In prayer. And just asking God, show me, lead me, help me. Paul was there in his, I don't know if it was his first or second missionary journey, I believe it was the first, the book of Acts. And, uh, you know, we think that if anybody's praying and God's listening, it would be the Apostle Paul. But he tries to go into Bithynia, he tries to go into other parts of Asia, and time and time again, what happens? The Holy Spirit puts a stop to it. He says, no, Paul. No, Paul. I believe he was praying. I believe he was seeking the Lord with all of his heart, all of his mind, all of his strength. I believe it was just as Jeremiah 33, 3, call upon me and I'll show you great mighty things which thou knowest not. And so he's praying. Lord, I... I'm your preacher. I'm the one who you call to be a vessel with your name to bear the message of the gospel to the Gentiles. And Lord, everywhere I turn, I'm getting nowhere. I keep getting shut doors. And then he has a vision that night. The Macedonian call. And God shows him where he needed to be during that time. Yes, there was a wait. <laughs> yes, there was a stop of many different avenues he was trying to approach. But God led him to where he needed to be. The Holy Spirit helps us in our spiritual warfare through the power of Christ and His Word. He helps us to stand up against spiritual deception like what Christ faced there in the, in the wilderness. Remember, He was driven out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Remember that? Like the Holy Spirit would never do that. Well, He did it with Christ. And we constantly use the Word of God. 
and dependence upon the Holy Spirit. He helps us to stand against spiritual deception. And uh, it's the Spirit where we realize the truth of Hebrews 2.18, for in that He Himself has suffered being tempted, He's able to secure them that are tempted. Oswald Chambers said this, he says, The Holy Ghost cannot delight in our wisdom, it's the wisdom of God that He delights in. And he said that just uh, particularly in the passage of when it comes to prayer. And he said, we try to pray in the best of the wisdom that we have, and that's exactly the opposite of what God wants. Because everything that we seem to try to do as spiritual people, when we realize that our prayer has got to be by faith, with nothing doubting, according to the will of God, that's the way that we are to pray when it's praying in the Holy Spirit. It's got to be that way. Lord, whatever Your will is, that's what I want for my life. If it means pain, I don't want it, but help me to endure it. Give me grace. That's sufficient. But that's the way that we're to pray. And then the, there's a reward when we depend upon Him. Habakkuk. Let's go back there. One of the minor prophets, Habakkuk chapter 2. It's close to where Jonah is. I wish I had all the minor prophets memorized and uh, the, the order. But the fact of the matter is, I struggle to find some of these as well as you do. So... There's Jonah, Micah, Habakkuk, Nahum, Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2. When we pray, there's also a time of waiting. Habakkuk is in a struggle. He knows that God is going to judge the nation of Israel. God shows him that He's going to use the pagan people to judge them. And uh, he's not satisfied with that. He says, Lord, why? Why the Babylonians? Why the Assyrians? Why? But then he calls upon the Lord. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I will stand upon the watch, set me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I will answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. Sometimes when we pray, it's we just got to wait for the answer. And if you're like me, I don't like to wait. You know, it's just a maybe it's the day and hour in which we live. Maybe it's just my flesh. Maybe it's just the carnal side of me. But we don't like to wait. We got to learn to wait upon the Holy Spirit before we act. <laughs> we just got to do what we know to be right and continue doing what we got to do until God changes our direction. That's, that's what it's all about, being obedient. It's one step at a time. And say, God, you got to show me where to turn. You got to show me what to do. Praying in the Holy Ghost. We find that in the book of Ephesians. We find it in the book of Romans. We find it in Jude. And every time that we find it's praying in the Holy Spirit, we find that there's troubles that, that, that are coming that are provoking this prayer, whether it's the flesh that we're dealing with, whether it's the, the, the submission and the headship and everything else that we find in Ephesians where he says you got your whole thinking entirely wrong. Whether it's in Jude where he talks about how we deal with the heretics and heresies that are going on. And said, Lord, this, this world is just in a constant mess. What do we do? He says, build yourself up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. How do we face the challenges of today? Praying in the Holy Spirit. It's kind of hard to really describe, isn't it? To break down into words. But you know, this is the same as what it was when you first got saved. The Holy Spirit came and indwelt you as a believer. You understood that you were a child of God. It says the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are the child of God. It talks about that crying out, Abba, Father. But you know if you're praying in the Spirit or not. And you know if you're play, praying in the flesh or not. To describe it, it's hard to tell. But you know if it's just like me trying to make something happen. You talk about praying for revival. Maybe I shouldn't say this since it's on YouTube, alright? But uh, some people, I'm convinced of this, and just do it out of like, I'm just doing it because I'm told and I'm just going to pray through. I want to make God do what I want Him to do. Now, that's not spiritual prayer. 
I mean, God's the praying sometimes is not just change the situation. Sometimes, many times, is to change us. Anybody have any thoughts or anything they want to add to the... Dis- Anybody at all? All right. Well, that's all that I got for you for Sunday school this morning. I hope it was a help and a blessing to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time together. Lord, I'm glad we have a direct line to you and we can call upon you at any time. And Lord, there are situations as we pray for little Robert, as we pray for my wife, as we pray for Lee Foster, as we pray for Brother Cook. Many of these things we're offering up. And we know that you're working everything for good and many times we just don't understand it. But Lord, your will be done. Help us to learn to pray in the Holy Spirit instead of dependence upon the flesh. And Lord, thank you for those groaning and utterances and straightening out our prayers for us. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.